that could cost Aurora in the long run. They could um, individually file their lawsuits for um, false arrest, that kind of thing. Aurora, not Augusta, Colorado, where the cops just pretty much arrested 40 people under suspicion. This is what we're witnessing. And like the song says, if you tolerate this, your children will be next. You're listening to episode 261, Disparate Youth. From MediaMonarchy.com, it's June 8th, 2012. My name's James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, DJ, and more from Media Monarchy, the real news remixed. And we're going over all the latest on MediaMonarchy.com, and we reach our media memes. Roll me up and celebrate. Darkness reigns in Hollywood. Fake story about Osama's late death coming to the big screen. We've reported this before. It's not actually coming out until December. And I think, as we noted a few moments ago, we give you the news before it's the news. So six months later, when Zero Dark 30 comes out, you'll say, oh, that's right, I heard about that on Media Monarchy. So it's Catherine Bigelow, it's Mark... Bowl, the screenwriter, and it concerns the leaks from the Obama administration, as we've already discussed, concerning Flame and Stuxnet, which we'll get into in just a little bit on Cyberspace War. We haven't mentioned in a while, but it's it's par for the course for Barry Satoro. His has been, as we've noted now for these last few years, the most hacked presidency, even from the very beginning, even before he had been selected Remember the what was it? The passport info that had been hacked, his BlackBerry, all of those things. I see it, unfortunately, as as a pattern, and we see it with the Secret Service, a setup on any number of levels. So this article in its entirety, Darkness Reigns in Hollywood, fake story about Osama's late death comes to the big screen, is originally on disquietreservations.blogspot.com. However, I want to mention two from allgov.com, which we auto-tweet all their stories on Twitter, at Media Monarchy. The first, can reality TV producers help Air Force drone wars? Flooded with an ever-increasing volume of images, U.S. military commanders in charge of drone surveillance have turned to an unexpected source for answers. Operators of unmanned aircraft are currently collecting more than 10,000 hours a month of footage that needs to be assessed and analyzed for intel purposes. This massive flow of info, which is expected to grow even larger, is overwhelmed with the current system in place for reviewing the data. So the military went to the RAND Corporation for answers, and the RAND Corporation turned to Hollywood for help, specifically producers of reality television series. RAND experts found that the task of reality TV producers isn't that much different from those overseeing America's fleet of drones. Programs like Survivor, South Pacific, and Jersey Shore amass thousands of hours of footage, all which, which must be reviewed in order to collect the most scintillating moments for viewers. The think tank asked the producers about the process and came away with four suggestions for the military. One recommendation said the U.S. Air Force may want to model their ground stations, where drone footage is reviewed, after a TV control room. This would entail arranging the room with one giant bank of screens at the front, with individual drone operators facing their own screen as well. Supervisors and operators would be able to would be able this way to see everything that's coming in to reduce the risk of a key image being overlooked. Other recommendations included replacing networked chat rooms with communication by headset, tagging scenes of interest to make them easier to organize and retrieve, and most important of all, creating ground stations that focus on just one area of surveillance each so that personnel become familiar with specific regions. The other concerning media memes, also from allgov.com, another question. Why are state, state taxpayers subsidizing big-budget films and TV shows? 
State officials have been lining up like kids outside a theater box office, spending more than $1 billion to coax Hollywood to film movies and television shows in various states. 43 states currently offer subsidies to production companies. Comparatively, only a handful of states were willing to do this back in 2002. During fiscal year 2010, when many states struggled to close budget deficits, about $1.5 billion went towards TV and film subsidies. Alaska and Michigan provided the most generous tax subsidies, 44 cents and 42 cents on the dollar, respectively, according to Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. The think tank has questioned spending so much to woo Hollywood producers to relocate their productions. Some movie and TV show makers didn't need the enticements to film in particular states, the center argued, adding that many production jobs are so specialized that the subsidies don't result in a lot of local hiring within states. Those jobs that are created are usually temporary and often only part-time. Subsidies don't pay for themselves, wrote Robert Tannenwald of the center, the revenue generated by economic activity induced by film subsidies falls far short of the subsidies' direct costs to the state. To balance its budget, the state must therefore cut spending or raise revenues elsewhere, dampening the subsidies' positive economic impact. You can get that report from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. It's called State Film Subsidies. Not much bang for too many bucks. Continuing our media memes, roll me up and celebrate. Back to you, Aaron Sorkin, returning to television with a new series called The Newsroom. And perhaps you caught the recent Google Doodle celebrating the drive-in, the first drive-in theater anniversary. They also note, actually, by the Christian Science Monitor, talks about the DIY drive-in movie revival. And that's just another way like so many other ways that everybody's kind of getting together and saying, hey, you know what? We're our own community. We can do this. We don't need a multinational corporation to do it for us. A lot of obituaries. Richard Dawson, Family Feud, Match Game, Hogan's Heroes, and most importantly, I think, The Running Man. Passes away at the age of 79. Catherine Joustin, star, co-star of Desperate Housewives, dies at the age of 72 just weeks after the show has run, it, run its course eight plus years or more, wherein her character dies in the final episode. Dick Beals, the voice of Gumby and the speedy Alka-Seltzer, dies at the age of 85. He has an interesting story with an ailment that made his voice sound tiny, which always got him jobs doing voiceover as as kind of small, childlike. Bob Welch, early Fleetwood Mac guitarist, kills himself at the age of 65. Lee Rich, founder of Lorimar Productions, dies at the age of 93. And as Colin Malloy of the Decemberists said on Wednesday morning, Scott Walker survives. Ray Bradbury dies. And then to make matters worse, Morrissey plans to retire in two years. Again, more on that from our Twitter feed, at Media Monarchy. You know we're a huge Smiths and Morrissey fan. The Queen is dead, boys. Long live the Queen. Or, as we again noted, her very low lowness with her head in a sling. I'm truly sorry, but it sounds like a wonderful thing. We have the final Whitney Houston song has been released, and it is called Celebrate. We'll listen to that a little bit later in the episode, featuring something called Jordan Sparks. How a Singing Convict Gave the Beach Boys a Hit, and it's not Charles Manson, at least not in this case. Another bit on Doc Watson, who we noted last week, even closed our episode 260, Spectator and Pupil, last week with the Rising Sun Blues, or House of the Rising Sun, as you may know it. BrassCheckTV.com has another bit on the folk music hero Doc Watson, dead at the age of 89, performing at Vietnam protests. Our artists used to protest things. 
We wrap up the media memes with another track we'll listen to later in the episode. It was the Country Music Television Awards the other night. And among all the other pop country garbage, we will note at least that Brad Paisley won some awards, and he's a nice boy from West Virginia like me. But Willie Nelson closed the show playing with a whole bunch of people with a song briefly called Roll Me Up. So when we roll that one out later in the episode, we'll explain and exclaim. Finally, on MediaMonarchy.com, the flagship site here, before we blast off into all the other sites in the Media Monarchy kingdom, Cyberspace War, Holy Hexes, Food World Order, Navigating Netflix, and of course, our Song of the Day weekly podcast, Pump Up the Volume. Our final post on Media Monarchy is the How They Want Me to Be News Purge. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be brief. Let's get it. Our Econo Crash updates. United Nations report says European crisis biggest threat to world economy. Fed survey finds U.S. growth and hiring is, is mostly steady. Forget all that horrible job stuff you heard last week. No Fed easing now. No quantitative easing just yet. But possible if growth slows, Bernanke says, offering little hope. And the market, again, as we see, like a junkie, needs more to get the fix. And there was only a little bit of a rally. Early rally fades after Bernanke's comments. More on these from the usual suspects at Reuters and CNBC and the Associated Press. Meanwhile, the Securities and Exchange Commission, in the pocket of huge serial violators, bragging in print about catching small fry companies. It's too hard and complicated to go after those big ones. That's why we prefer to knock on the little guy who maybe didn't you know, pay his protection bracket. Regulators ignore J.P. Morgan unit that lost billions. And our last econo crash note, majority of recent high school grads are unemployed. Jobless, if you will. Our geopolitical notes. Syria rebels, though disparate, are tenacious in crackdown. And as I've noted time and time again, putting these episodes together, you can see the signs and the symbols and, and the memes, and it all comes together in one part ways that I plan and then other ways that present themselves as we're reading it into the record. United Russia pushes for military training in schools, U.S. Navy to move 60% of the warships to Asia, do you notice a theme here, geopolitically speaking? Panda plus bear. Australia's secret plan for war with China uncovered. Spanic and Grexit and Europe's flying money. Again, a question from allgov.com. What's next for the family the U.S. put in power in Afghanistan? And as we note, things moving so quickly... I don't think I did quite registered that the Karzai drug family is, is going to be moving on. Major Al-Qaeda leaders killed in U.S. drone strikes. And our last geopolitical note is satire, maybe? It's from The Onion. And it's not an audio piece, though we will get one in this episode. I just saw it on their regular Twitter feed at The Onion. DHS creates fenced-in enclosure for Al-Qaeda to safely carry out attacks. And I ask, in reply, is that part of Operation Cyclone? 